You're listening to the Trailblazers Podcast, episode 55 with Devin Robinson. You're listening to the Trailblazers Podcast, where we will explore the stories of successful Black professionals. Join us as we highlight the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished trailblazers to help provide the know-how, confidence, and motivation you need to blaze your trail. And now, here's your host, Stephen Hart. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Trailblazers podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Hart, and today's guest is Mr. Devin Robinson, known to many as Professor Devin. He is a business and economics professor and author of eight self-help books. His latest book is Power Move, How to Become a Successful Entrepreneur. He was born and raised in St. Thomas, United States Virgin Islands, and served two terms in the United States Army before leaving in 1998 to become a network engineer at MCI WorldCom. While there, as we all know, the company went through the largest accounting scandal in U.S. history. And after surviving a series of massive layoffs, you know, Devin decided he was going to go ahead and resign from his position and pursue a full-time career as an entrepreneur and made a vow within to do everything right that his former employer did wrong. Professor Devin appeared in the Black Hair documentary as a store owner in March 2007, and that led to him writing the book, Taking It Back, How to Become a Successful Black Beauty Supply Store Owner in November 2007. And he sold over 25,000 copies independently. He's appeared in many publications, and you're in for some entrepreneurialism in this episode. So please go ahead, get your notepads open and get set to hear today's conversation with our trailblazer, Devin Robinson. Enjoy. <laughs> Professor Devin, thanks so much for being our featured guest on today's episode. Yes, thanks for having me on. I'm happy to be here. So we love to start off all our episodes from a place of gratitude. I find that it gets us off on the right track. And so I'd love to invite you to tell us what you're most grateful for in your life right now. <laughs> to be honest, it's something I've been grateful for um, for several years. And it's actually my state of mind wow. <laughs> because it helps me. Um, I love being at peace in my in my in my environment. And to know that I can lose all tangibles, you know, in life, you know, outside of the intrinsics, like your family, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for a loving family as well, which is irreplaceable, but the tangibles could go away. But if you have the right state of mind, you can always weather any type of challenge or struggle that comes your way. So I often see people struggle with that, getting through challenges and often overlook that whatever they have amassed in their lives or however far they've come in their lives, um, it's it's a compilation of the decision-making of their minds. And if they just be grateful to still have that retained, they can always recover from any setback that they have. Couldn't agree more, man. That's so true. As I read, you are a serial entrepreneur to tens, if not probably hundreds of businesses across across the country, right? Is this, is this all correct? Yes, we've we've incubated over a hundred a hundred businesses. Over wow! 100, yes. So I'm curious to know, you know, what ignited the desire to become an entrepreneur? Where did this all begin? Well, I think I had the bug. I was bitten by the bug at, at a young age. I've always been this type of opportunistic type of person, right? Economically, I talk about when I was in the military. My first business venture was I owned vending machines. Really? Um, yeah, and it kind of stumbled upon it because this guy, he owned the vending machines, but he was get, getting ready to leave and go to another duty station. Hmm. But he didn't want to take the machines with him because the, 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 the locations he had them, the people were so loyal. So he told me about it. I'm like, I'll buy them from you. So I bought two. And after buying the two and I saw how successful it was, I want to buy several more. And I just had them all over the place. But when I tell that story, I think about, you know, I had to go back to my childhood one time and I said, you know what? That really wasn't my first entrepreneurial endeavor. So my very, very first entrepreneurial endeavor, I was in the seventh grade. Wow. And I um, begged my mother to get me. I don't know if you, you, you remember these, like there were souped up remote control cars. There was like a crave back in, in the day and um, they had different names and stuff, but they were pretty expensive, right. for, you know, in, in this grand scheme of a toy. Um, but there were these cars that were pretty fast and they were like off-road, doom buggy type looking cars. Yeah. And and the one I wanted 
was called a grasshopper. Yeah, the grasshopper, <laughs> the fox, the hornet, you know, these different cars. And I wanted a grasshopper. And I begged my mother for months upon months upon months because this was the crave, but the car had cost $200. Wow. And at that time, you know, this is in the 80s, the late 80s, $200 for a car, like, that was crazy. <laughs> a remote control car is 20 bucks, 30 bucks, you know. Right, right. 200 it was a hard sell. But I begged and I told her I would never want anything again in my life. It was just a big deal for me. <laughs> Other kids had theirs. And I eventually broke her down. I can't remember if I got it for my birthday or for Christmas, um, but I, I got it. And when I got it, I was the only kid on my, my street that had it. Mm-hmm. And all the kids, you know, wanted to get their turn at, you know, this this car that goes 30 miles per hour. I mean, they were fast cars. And one day I decided to start renting usage of the car. <laughs> so, <laughs> so so, I would like, you know, you how you would go to an amusement park and get into a go-kart That's and right. pay for it. That's right. Well, it was the same concept. But I was like, no, you could drive it until the battery dies, but you have to pay me $25. You know, I was like renting the car. And... <laughs> I was actually making money off of these kids. And, you know, it was, I think one day my mother found like a hundred dollar bill in, in my, in like, my drawer. Where you find- <laughs> she, yeah, she was like, where you got this from? And I'm like, you know, because it was a hard hundred dollar bill. And I'm like, oh, you know, and I told her that one of the guys that went to the car, she was like, he don't work. He can't afford to give you no hundred dollars. She said he must be stealing it from his parents. And I'm like, why would you think that? She, You know, she's like, he's a young kid. He can't. So she was like, no, I'm taking this money to his mother. And so said, so done. She took it to her mother, his mother, and he was stealing the money from his parents. So I was like, oh, man. Wow. You know, my, you know, my endeavor was that hot that I had kids stealing, <laughs> you know, from their, their mother. So I, I reflect on like that was like I think it was something that was just in me from young to be an entrepreneur. But I never really, you know, took the step until I was working in corporate America and I was working for this company that um, that 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 was going through a huge scandal, and you know they were just laying off people left and right, and and it, and it was just a it was like one of those moments in 2002 when I was like you know I could be next I have to really think um, like like I, you know I started to think about stuff like if I was to be one of those people that got laid off how long can I go without income what would I do next and. When I start looking at it, I'm like, I'm living check to check. I'm living like just how the sellers of America want me to live. The retailers want me to live like this mm-hmm. and I have to change it. So I just hatched a plan to be put myself in a comfortable position and eventually become an entrepreneur. And within within about 18 months, so said, so done. I, I, I you know, took my leap of faith. And I've been a full-time entrepreneur ever since. Wow. I've heard you quoted as saying that entrepreneurship is the, the 21st century civil rights movement and that you believe that, you know, the increase of black business ownership would decrease crime and other social problems that plague ur- urban cities. Yeah, absolutely. You know, statistics show that 83% of all the crime that's committed in, in, the, in the black community are economically driven. Mm. So it's, it's a lot of crime of from drug dealing to robbery to embezzlement to burglaries, um, it's it, their economic crimes. So it's basically boiling down to we don't employ ourselves, right? And if you really think, take a hard look at that, we do not employ ourselves. Now the black community in America has a one point two trillion dollar spending power, but I always try to de- debunk that that statistic into showing like we really don't have real power because. We don't have the the payroll power. So if we have this this 1.2 trillion spending power, but we don't employ ourselves, we we really don't have any power. Because if 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 all the people that employ black businesses decide to wake up tomorrow and fire all of us, it's we're gonna be a destitute community overnight. So so to me, you know, with the right to vote, the right to practice religion, free speech. Um, you, you know, all these things that we fight for, what we don't realize is that every day we make an economic decision. Every day we make a consumption decision. So, yeah, we can have the right to vote, but can we fund a campaign? Yeah, we can um, have bridges named after some of our martyrs in, in, in a symbolic fashion, but who had the contract to maintain those bridges? So it's like we have these um, mm. altruistic steps when it comes to civil rights, but we don't realize that 
uh, our world when it looks when it looks at black people is less racist and more classist than anything else. They look at us as a as a group of people that have no power and that are destitute. So it becomes an issue of what black represents. You know what I'm saying? It's not that people don't like black because you know we see them copy our fashion and our music and these other different things. It, it, it comes at issue of what we represent. So they don't expect us to represent a people of power. So until we can harness that economic power, um, we're going to constantly have civil rights and human rights issues. So what do you think then is the biggest barrier to business ownership, right? Is, is it a lack of capital, knowledge, mentorship? Like what, I, what bridges that, that gap? I, I, think, I think really the problem is, is knowledge. Um, it, it, it's wisdom, right? Right. And, and it's not the wisdom in just running up, like knowing how to run a business in the sense of the hard skills. So the hard skills may be knowing how to balance um, the checkbook or pay your taxes or do a marketing campaign. You know, some of these inventory management, these are some of the harder skills, right? This, the soft skills is really what trips us up. And the soft skills is really embedded into our culture. So what are we a culture of? So are we a people that um, know how to conserve money, know how to have self-control and financial discipline mm. to build wealth? Because if you really look at us, right, I go back to the 1.2 trillion spending power. So we have all this money that passed through our hands, but we that. still struggle building wealth. Yep. So it, it really boils down to our behavior and our cultural design. You know what I'm saying? Because we can teach people and give them the capital and give them the loan to go into business. But if we don't have a sense of understanding of how we operate on a personal level, all the issues that we have and the dysfunctions we have as personal individuals, we're going to take that into the business Mm -hmm. and then the business is going to fail. You know what I'm saying? So it's really a paradigm shift in who we are and how we understand ourselves to be. Um, If we can shift that, then we can find ourselves being more successful in business. And then when we're taught the business strategies, it'll be easier for us to adapt them and be successful at it. You know, I constantly tell people that black entrepreneurship is a separate study from entrepreneurship. We can't go out and get basic entrepreneurship training and then be successful as black people because we have our own separate challenges. We have discrimination issues. We have um, interpersonal issues. We have struggles within our community that we have first have to get over. We can't just tell a black entrepreneur, hey, put together a great business plan and you go to that bank and you're going to get the money. You're not going to get the money. So it's not that simple. So for us, we have to go an extra step. So so there's there's a piece of the black entrepreneurship experience that has to be trained, which we focus on in our training. We talk about how to um, deal with some of the discrimination, the racism, how to deal with self-hate, how to deal with the black customer expecting certain things from uh, the black entrepreneur that they would not ex- expect from a, a non-black entrepreneur. Wow. So there are certain things that we have to address and we have to overcome before we can really step into the realm of entrepreneurship and be successful at it because it's just two different studies altogether. Man, I, I feel like you're really taking me to school, professor. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have you, you know, share with us some challenges or failures along your path and what you were able to learn from them. Well, I would say one of the most defining challenges that I had is when I opened a um, beauty supply store in 2005 in an Asian dominated industry. Wow. Um, I couldn't get products, uh, lost tens of thousands of dollars in that endeavor um, and really had to figure some things out in order to be successful at it. Um, one of the things that I that I dug into was, and this is what we tend to do, and, and I see a lot of people in that industry struggle with it. They, they go after um, the businesses and when they find resistance from Asian people, they become aggressive and, and bullish and the Asians are not gonna respond favorably to that. And what I learned was I learned some things 10 years prior to that. 10 years prior to that, I lived in Korea for a year. Uh And not knowing that my experiences over there was going to help me 10 years later in my entrepreneurial experience. Right. So some of the cultural things and the foods and the drinks and the places, I was able to identify with them 
and then I was able to um, connect with them. You know what I'm saying? So once I connected with them, I was able to um, break those barriers down and then be successful in my own businesses. But I first had to connect with them culturally. So once I learned that, the, the tens of thousands that I lost initially, of course, I recovered. And then I decided to show other people the right approach to making that happen rather than going the route that we're so used to um, taking. Right, right. So I know you own a, a good bit of businesses in the beauty industry and you teach a lot of people that. Are you in other industries as well? Yeah, I mean, we have the Urban Business Institute. Um, we teach general entrepreneurship stuff. Um, you know, we teach people how to transition properly from employee to employer. We have six different programs. Um, we have a retailing program. We have an investors program wow. um, where, we, where we talk about teaching you how to trade stocks and commodities and stuff like that. Um, we have a program that's for employers, existing employers, teaching them how to be better leaders and ensure that they create a staff because really that's what it's about. You're not going to find freedom in entrepreneurship being self-employed. And self-employed meaning you're the deliverer of those services, right? So you're in business and you have a business license, but you're the actual electrician. So you have to get up and go to work to get paid as an electrician. You don't really own the business. The business owns you. Right. Until you can turn that into an actual system where you have other electricians under you, you're probably selling lighting fixtures or other things like in a retail environment as being an electrician so you can install the stuff that you sell, but people can come buy it on their own and you have employees that way you could be sick. You could go on vacation. You know, those types of things don't string you out. Yes. You're you're really putting yourself in a vulnerable position. And too many times Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, they just chase the money rather than having the patience to build a system. Right. So we we teach people how to do that in our employer program. And then we have an uh, other program, which is the enterpriser program. And what we teach there is um, how to build up your succession plan, because we want our businesses to outlive us, not us outlive the business. Because it's about legacy, you know what I'm saying? And we're not going to change the community um, by being self-employed, by not having sustainable businesses where other people can be employed. Everyone in our community can't be entrepreneurs. But what I talk about is the knowledge gap, right? So our community is hemorrhaging from, 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 from talent because we go to college, we run up these high uh, tuition expenses, we come out and we sell our skills to the highest and most secure bidder. Mm. The the highest and the most secure bidder typically is not the black owned business. Mm. So now we have degreed individuals with high skill sets that have no interest in entrepreneurship, taking those skills and selling it to the non-black businesses that wind up building and building and building funding campaigns to politicians that don't have our best interests. So by the time we realize that a company doesn't have our best interests, it's too late. We've made them super wealthy. Right. So then we have the black businesses that stay there and struggle because the people who are left start trying to start businesses are not the degreed people. They're the rejects. They're the ones with felony convictions, high school dropouts, or they're frustrated with corporate America. So then they decide to do the entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is not our first choice. It's our fifth choice. You know what I'm saying? So then we do that, but then we have black businesses struggling. And then we have the issue of the stereotypes of black owned businesses. People are saying, oh, black that black business is not as good as the white business. Well, the people, the black people who are saying that they are to blame because not only are they not patronizing the business at the high level that they should without expecting, having unrealistic expectations, but they also themselves are not working for a black owned business where they're helping to build it and flourish. So we see these problems that permeating through our society and then we have these issues. So the enterprising program is to make sure people understand how to create a businesses that will outlast them and outlive them. And, um, you know, people can have a succession plan to go in and continue the business when they're long and gone. I mean, you think about companies like Walmart and um, these other old businesses, you will see Microsoft, that's going to happen. Apple, of course, that has already happened. You know, these people can be gone and these businesses continue to thrive. Take me through a, a couple of steps, right, that an aspiring entrepreneur listening to us right now could maybe take to, to lay the right foundation for success as a business owner? 
Well, I, I, I can tell you very simply. So in my book, Power Move, the move stands for mindset, order, vacate, and execute, right? And that's really the steps to transitioning. You first have to get the mindset together. You have to open up that awareness, you know, find that awareness in you for your mindset, your cultural behavior, um, the things that you do as an individual. Do you make a good entrepreneur and you can test those things by running your household and looking at how you run your household, right? Okay. So you can look at your household and say, do I have a, a, a positive cash flow or negative cash flow? Am I carrying too much debt? Do I pay my bills on time? Will I be able to make payroll? Because am I paying all my bills without struggle? So you have to find your mindset first, so If you're right? not taking care of yourself, you don't need to be taking care of a business. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so if you struggle with that, you're going to struggle with business because I see so many people that have a hard time paying employees if they're not going to get paid as well. And I'm like, your, your employees got to get paid first. So you, you got you to gotta suck out. You got to struggle. You know what I'm saying? And people don't get that. They're <laughs> right. like, but it's my business. It don't matter because you're, you're running a marathon, not a sprint. Let these people get paid. Let their morale continue to build so they can continue to invest in you and you will get yours later. You don't get yours now and you can't think selfishly like that. Right. When you work for a company, um, you get paid first. You say you pay yourself first and that's what popular society tells you. You make sure you get paid first, right? So you pay yourself first, you put your money in your savings, but when you're an entrepreneur, you're getting paid last. You have to make sure everything else is covered before you get paid. So that is a mindset thing. And then getting things in order. Um, before you step out there in entrepreneurship, you want to get yourself in order. You want to have low consumption and high um, productivity. So you start to watch your bills. You start to look at what's really a necessity. What do you need? Is this a need versus a want? You got to get, um, get those things straight. And then these vacate. So now this is when I spoke about earlier. You vacate bad habits. So you as an employee, if you've been a lifelong employee, you really have to be careful in jumping out there into entrepreneurship, especially when you're going to have competition. Because if your competition has been in business for 10 years, they have 10 years experience ahead of you. Right. If you're coming in as an employee mindset, you can't think that you're going to go in day one and then all of a sudden run them out of town. You're going to have a struggle. Yes. So the V you have to do is you have to vacate those those tendencies of, of, um, of, of bad habits of being an employee and high consumption, that kind of stuff. And then of course, E stands for execute. That's when you actually now start taking the steps to start your business, get your business license, look for locations, the products, the services, making sure that it's of high quality um, and that you can stand the test of time in any market you choose to enter. So those are kind of like some of the quick steps that people can, can take. Of course, there's some more details to that. Um, I, I believe uh, successful entrepreneurs have a high um, psychological acumen. So psychology was one of my favorite, two, I have two favorite subjects in college, psychology and economics. So economics, um, oddly, is a, a, a byproduct or, or result of psychology. Psychology is really what business is. Learning how to read people, learning how to have good social skills, customer service, um, learning yourself, your own self-control and discipline and patience and you know, it's business is highly psychological. So yes. if you if you can if you can master that those types of the psychological part and knowing how to read people and connect with them and make them feel whole and be considerate to how uh, your business treats other people, you're going to be very successful. Right. So those are some of the areas that I that I would say um, becomes your strength when you talk about being a full time entrepreneur. Part time entrepreneur is easy. If you if you're getting a full time check from someone else, ah, you can feel fail or not as a part-time entrepreneur. But when you focus on being a full-time entrepreneur, the game changes. Yes. You know, I find it really interesting that, you know, this MOVE uh, acronym you just shared a minute ago, execute was the last thing. You really spent a lot of time planning before taking that jump. And, you know, I feel like all too often, too many of us are quick to jump without having a plan in place. Yeah, you know, one of the reasons is because entrepreneur is one of it is like it's like a catch twenty two. The the feel of entrepreneurship is 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 bittersweet. So it's like you you don't have to um, have a degree to become an entrepreneur. Um, so many people believe entrepreneur is common sense, right? And and it really is not common sense. It's a lot of intuition, 
but it's not common sense. It's not like being a doctor. So if you're if you're a doctor and you try and be like a anesthesiologist, right? You study you study chemistry, uh, formulas. You know, E equals M C squared. You you know that, right? Right. But in in entrepreneurship, this does not equal that. You know what I'm saying? Like it 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 it's more of a you have to figure it out as you go. You can reinvent the wheel. Doctors rarely can reinvent a wheel. Like right. It's it's science. So what it is is what it is. You you can't, you know what I'm saying? We breathe oxygen, not nitrogen. You can't change that, right? So you know what it takes to knock someone out. You know what it takes to wake them up. And this is what it is. In mm. entrepreneurship, you can quit school and become an entrepreneur, right? So people tend to look at that as, well, I don't have to get certifications and state licenses and all this stuff to become an entrepreneur. So I'm going to just do it because they think it's a study of common sense. And many people go out and they fail. And, and you know, the 80 percent of the businesses that fail in their first uh, five years, um, it's like something like 90 something percent is 92.7 percent of them fail because they never had formal entrepreneurship training. Mm. They just went out there and use common sense. So the number one cause of failure in business is not capital. It's, it's not the lack of support. It's ignorance. Wow. That's China thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, you touched on the importance earlier about making sure you take care of your employee, right? And making sure the employee kind of wins and paying yourself, paying them first and building them up. I, I'm curious, you know, I'd love to hear your take on how you go about finding the right people to bring into your organizations that truly care about your businesses the way that you actually do. Okay, so... What I hire is I, I, I look more at integrity over skills, right? Because you can train for the skills. Yes. You can't train for the integrity, right? So competence can be cultivated, but a conscience cannot, right? You, you'll spin your wheels doing that. Right. So that's the first thing. You, you want to get good people. You know what I'm saying? You want to hire like good people. So finding good people, you could make requirements such as, you know, how many you, you look at their volunteering, their community service. You know what I'm saying? Typically good people are into stuff like that, right? Right. Because we tend to think, well, good people are people who don't have a felony conviction. Well, I tell them you, you have way more criminals in society than we think. Hmm. It's just some got caught and some didn't. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. You have a bunch of bad people without a felony conviction, they just didn't get caught. So you can't use, if you have a felony conviction to rule people out. And some people got felony convictions and they're good people. So what we have to look at is their consciousness and if they're good and what they do in their spare time, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. And you bring them in. And one of the things with me is you can't work for any one of my businesses without going through extensive testing. Wow. So, so one of the, uh, the things that I find very, very important when you're building a team is the indoctrination process. Yes. I don't believe in just bringing them in, hiring them and putting them to work. They have to go through one, you know, my retail stores, they go through training for six weeks. We, my other businesses average about two weeks. And I'm talking about formal training. Like they, they have to sit and watch videos, take tests. They have to pass the assessments. They have to download files, they have to read materials, because what I try to focus on is, is creating a uniform workforce, right? So I want everyone to be high, be working on a high level, on a very high level. And I can't, I can't depend on that to be based on the person who was training them at that time. So I have formal training that everyone goes through. So everyone's on the same page right. so that when it's time for them to get to work, they're, they're, they have optimal performance. And I found that that is, works well in my favor. Some people don't even make it past training. Some people don't make it through the first pay cycle because it's just a higher, more difficult thing that they can, they can keep up with. And some right. people have, have given us feedback like, Man, that your training is more extensive than corporate America companies right. that I work for. Right. And I'm I'm like, yeah, because this is corporate America. Don't don't minimize my thing. This is corporate America. <laughs> so 
you know, I make sure that um that they get the right training and, and you know make sure that the right that the right people coming through the doors. Right, right. I love this. I really appreciate all this wisdom and knowledge. You know, what I'm curious to know before we start wrapping up here, what's one thing that you wish you had known before you began your entrepreneurial journey? Oh man, one thing that I wish I had known is the importance of knowledge, right? So I, I believe that ignorance is more expensive than education. Mm. So if, if I had really understood the, 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 the need to get, uh, get under the, the training or the tutelage of someone who has traveled the road that I have already traveled, right? that would have saved me a ton of major headaches. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It would have saved me tons of headaches. So I know you've written a dozen books, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's been some of the books that you've read, as you're talking about here just a second ago, what's some of the books that you've read that, that have inspired you most? Yeah, well, some books that are, that, you know, some that jump out that I, that I would say many of them are timeless classics um, that has left some of the biggest impressions on me, of course, is Think and Grow Rich right. and Napoleon oh, yeah. Hill, The Millionaire Next Door, Who Moved My Cheese, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, those are some of the books that have been very, very pivotal. The Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, which I think is a necessary read for every entrepreneur, including right. my books. But <laughs> The Outliers is a book that, you know, there's one part in a book that really drills down on why some people are successful and others aren't. And he, 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 he showcased that illustration of in order to be, to rise above the, the masses of people that are your competition or in your marketplace, in order to rise above them, you have to practice your craft for at least 10,000 hours, right? You have to have at least 10,000 hours of practice. Right. And he, he, he showcased people like, um, Venus and Serena Williams, Tiger Woods, Jay Z, you know, these different people who put in a lot of effort, banging at their craft all energy, long time, yeah, at right. their craft. And then all of a sudden they rose above everyone else. Right. So those are some of the books that I, I highly recommend. Yes. Love it. Actually just finished a couple weeks ago, listening to tipping point, like two or three times in audiobook. And love, love Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, Tipping Point is another good one. I, I really like that. Um, you know, talking about the Paul Revere, you yes. know, syndrome, why he was able to um, rally the people and get them to un- to believe that the, you know, the British were coming. Yes. Um, you know that that was that was a, a, a real instrumental part of the book as well. They're showing the difference between um, the mavericks and the movers and the different people who get the word out That's right. versus them who are the connectors that just plug people together. So yes. yeah, that that was very important to me. Yes, yes. I'd love for you to maybe share with us a resource, like a app, software, or tool that you use every day and you can't live without it. You know, I am not a highly techie person. <laughs> um, but if if I would say there's a tool that I use, and this just this this sounds very basic, right? Is YouTube. I use a lot of YouTube, and what I use YouTube for are the interviews. And I don't be on there just you know looking for silly videos. Right. Interviews. Interviews are so important to your development. When you look at people and you get the opportunity to hear their journey, yes. their struggles what they did right, what they did wrong, those things work out to a huge benefit. Um, so I spend a lot of time on YouTube just researching interviews and seeing what I can digest from other people who, you know, have gone on the road I'm trying to travel. I know you're an active YouTuber. Is there other um, channels that you, you find yourself watching on YouTube a lot? Um, there's no specific channel that I watch. I, my my thing has recognized that I look at a lot of interviews, so now when I open it, ah, it, it gives, it gives me suggestions. Them. Right, right, yeah, right, so, right. So I'm seeing, you know, I'm all over the globe on, on different, <laughs> different so interviews. I. So am I. So, you know, we're we're getting set to wrap up here, but I'd love to invite you, you know, as we get set to end this call, um, I'd love for you to share one action that our, our future trailblazers should commit to this week to help them blaze their trail? Journal. Journal your thoughts, right? Yes. So um, first of all, you got to get up early. You know, like I I don't let my kids sleep 
past eight o'clock in the house. I said nobody who's not earning or paying bills don't sleep past eight o'clock in my house. I wish I could so, sleep till eight. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're lucky I let them go that far because I'm up from four or five. You know, I have very odd hours. Right. Um. So so that's it for me. So I um. I would say journal your ideas because yes. you 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 would think that because you're thinking about something right now you're gonna you're gonna always remember it because it's so fresh in your mind. No, you but some of our most quick. brilliant thoughts yeah. come and go and we never get it back. Yes. So when you have something and I do this all day every day when I have a, a, a idea and I have a whole listen I actually have movie scripts that I've written. <laughs> I have three I have three movies that I've written and I'm like okay I don't have connection to Hollywood or the film industry. But I'm gonna write these movies and have them ready just in case. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they're great love movies. It. Love it. Written. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, when is that gonna happen? Love but I, I took know. those ideas and I put them down so that I can capture them for later. And that's how I write my books. That's how I write my columns, my articles. Um, and that's how I have, you know, a, a list of business ideas that I I wanna go into. Cause everything because you have the idea now doesn't mean you should take the action now. Right. But you should make sure you journal your ideas, because that is where your wealth and your commerce is, in your ideas. I know you're saying out of techie, so I'm assuming you're, you're handwriting a lot of your, your, your journaling. I Everyone listening knows I'm an Evernote junkie, and mm-hmm. it's an app that I have on my phone, on my desktop, and I do exactly what you're talking about. I've actually begun the process of journaling daily, even if it's just a, a couple sentences, but I try to journal every day, kind of the activities of the day. Mm-hmm. And just what you said, I mean, so often, if you can't capture that thought, you know, right when it's fresh, you come back the next morning and you're like, what was I thinking about yesterday? Forget the idea. It's yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, it, I mean, I'm not a techie, but I'm not a dinosaur. So I'm not writing yes. <laughs> the, the things out. I actually do use my phone and my books, uh, over seventy percent of all my books were written on my phone. Really? So yeah, I write my books on my phone. And <laughs> I write, I write chapters. I sit down, I write it, and I email it to myself, and then I you nice. know put it in the right files, and you know send them to the editors, and and, and we make it happen. So um, I'm actually using my phone for. Devin, I have you have to download Evernote. I'm telling you, you're gonna. Oh love really? It. Yeah, man. You got you would love Evernote for that reason because what you type in your phone would just mm-hmm. sync immediately to your desktop. So you could pick up right when you reach your computer oh, and continue. Oh, okay. That's, okay. that's the beauty of Evernote. Okay, I'm going to look into that. Yeah, man. So tell us how we can stay connected to you, and we'll go ahead and finish up for today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my website is like the uh, the center, the uh, ground zero to get to me. So right. devinrobinson.com, D-E-V-I-N robinson.com. You go there, um, you sign up for my weekly power moments that I send out. You can sign up for my daily power thoughts, quotes that I, original quotes that I send out. Um, you can um, get s- subscribed to, you know, my events or the latest and greatest, my newsletters. You can get my books there. You know, you could get information and, and stuff from me. Um, DevinRobinson.com is a place to go. And my social media, you know, the, everything's there on the website that you can tap me. Awesome. Um, but my social media, my, my, my large social media uh, presence, Black 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 Businesses Matter. We got about 30,000 followers there. Um, so, you know, we, we share information about black businesses and the tours that we're on as well. Awesome. Awesome. And for those listening, I'm going to make sure I put all the links and resources that we discussed on today's episode on our show notes page at tbpod.com. Devin, you know, before we let you go, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Your wisdom, uh, I mean, you dropped so much knowledge tonight. You know, I, I'm here taking a bunch of notes and there are no margins left. <laughs> and, uh, I'm loving it, man. There's there's a lot of good stuff in this episode. So I appreciate you, you know, for being so kind and so transparent to, to, to share your story, you know, with our community. And you're now part of the Trailblazer family. So we look forward to, to connecting with you online and, and keeping, you know, in, in abreast of all the movements that, that will happen for you in, in the year ahead. Um, so thank you so much. 
Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I look forward to talking to your people. Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Trailblazers podcast. I'll be posting links to all of today's book recommendations and links mentioned on our show notes page at tbpod.com. If today was your first time listening to the Trailblazers podcast, I just want to extend a warm Trailblazers welcome to you. We're so happy to have you here and we encourage you to go ahead and hit that subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. Go ahead and browse through some of our past episodes to keep the knowledge flowing. If you're a fan of the podcast and today's content and you're maybe already subscribed to the podcast, please continue to share and invite your friends, your family, your colleagues to listen to an episode that you think might impact them most. We believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories will be moved to make significant changes that will have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday by about 5 a.m. Eastern. Trailblazers, jump off this podcast today. Go find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail. Cheers.